Jordan's subjective. Jordan's subjective. Jordan's subjective perspective. <laughs> but yeah, it's good to see you. Same deal. How have you been? Pretty well. Pretty well. Yeah. I don't know why. Whenever you said Trump, it made me think of Zlatan, and it made me think of Kanye. <laughs> I think all three of those are just very comparable guys. Oh yeah. I mean, they just like have the most massive egos on the planet i think like no one could be those people <laughs> other than those people you know absolutely Th- the funny thing about like kanye's last album is i feel like it was like almost him apologizing for being like i'm a god for like seven eight years you know like his gospel record you know what i'm talking about i haven't listened to it at all but i know i know exactly what you're talking about well yeah he says that the only music he's gonna release is gospel music now and Interesting. I, f- I feel like that's like a. I heard it was a flop. Is a that true? Uh, some of the songs are good, but the way that uh my friend talked about it, and I kind of agree, is like something Kanye produces. The thing about Kanye is he his production is like insane. Like he produces in terms of just production value the best music. But I think I think I would agree with that. I'm trying to think of somebody who comes, like, close. Nobody comes close in my mind. Yeah, I mean, like... Life of Pablo, man, they're just some incredible... I, the thing I love on that album is the... Gloria! <laughs> Step up in this bitch like... I don't know when your bitch like, like... Gloria! <laughs> I don't know what they're saying, but it's yeah. aggressive and it's fun. Yeah, I mean, it's just, like, it's easy to listen to, you know? But he's not the best rapper. Like, his lines are kind of slow, you know. I would agree. Um, and, like, he kind of, like, repeats himself in a lot of the songs. But it's not, like, super witty music. No, no. Like, I don't know. I think there's, like, a lot more rappers I could listen to and be like, this means something to me. Graduation's pretty empowering, Oh, though. his... It's a very empowering... His early stuff, I mean, it just, like, speaks revelations to, like what an like what a performer goes through when they need to get their first break like their music is always going to be like so good like the graduation like all the college dropout albums i i'd put them up there like with some of my favorite music ever like hey mama mm-hmm. you know i got some love to you and i'm so proud of you so good man I could like jam to that shit. It's feel good. It it pumps you up and yeah. kind of feel. It makes you ready to take on the day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But Did like, you realize that you, you are, are a champion? champion? It's so good. That right you, now, <laughs> you know. I I love also uh like I work at Olive Garden now and every once in a while I'll hear like they play this older music and sometimes uh-huh. I'll hear things that are referenced yeah. in like maybe Kanye's or I'll hear like an old song and then Kanye will yeah. come up later on. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, it's the work he puts in and all the references he does and then he just revamps it all. It's incredible. Yeah. One of the songs that I've listened to recently is like that blood on the leaves one. That's like an old sample, like blood on the leaves. It's like so good. But I don't think like, I've ever heard it. It was like a really good song originally, and it was like very pivotal and like a very like crucial song originally. He just like the th- the thing about him is he can take like a really pivotal song, especially early in his career, and like make it just as pivotal in this generation. So that's an art in itself. Yeah, I'm surprised more artists don't focus on that on on kind of taking older music and then producing it to such a high quality. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I don't feel like too many artists really do that. I mean, like that's like kind of like the whole sampling thing. Like you sampled songs, and like Common would do that, but Common also had Kanye, so Common, Kanye produced Common songs and stuff. So the thing about it, like, oh, there's so many like times where you can just bring up an artist and be like, oh yeah, like Kanye f- had a hand in that at some point. Like, Big Sean. Yeah. Who else? Travis uh, Scott, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, in the family. Yeah, like, and also, Chance. like, it's like the Chainsmokers song with Coldplay. Like, that song's amazing. It has, like, over a billion views on or listens to Wait, what's that song? Oh, fuck. 
I hate referencing something and then like you forget the song. Well, it's hard to get, come up with the lyrics, you know, yeah, right off the yeah. top of your head. Yeah, but it's like a really, really big song. But it was really good. It's a really good song. Mm. Yeah. It's like on. It's like one of uh, the bumpin' songs, you know. You don't hear very bumpin' songs from Coldplay, but that song bumps. I did like. Did Kanye like influence that at all? They probably thought of Kanye during the process, at least, you know. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's just crazy. Artists, artists are amazing. I mean. I never realized for years later that Kanye actually produced his own beats as well. Yeah. And that just made me appreciate him a lot more. Do you know that song, Lift Yourself, by Kanye, the one that's like, scoopity poop, poop? Yeah, poop. yeah. I heard that that... <laughs> I heard that the reason that he put that verse in <laughs> in that song was because Drake like called him up and was like, "Hey, I think this beat's fucking sick, and I could use it. I could really use it, Kanye. Uh, he'll pro- he was probably like, I could pay you this much money. I want to use this beat." And Kanye was like, "Fuck no!" And then he like made that scoopity poop poop. He just like totally debauched it. But it's still, like, a great song, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I just wish I could sing it right now. I just, like, everything, like, is going in and out of my brain, my brain skis. Who would you say, if we had, if you had to say, like, estimate five artists, artists, like, just Uh artists in general. We could say rap specifically if you want. Yeah. But that are going to be, like, most remembered from this time. Uh, from if you want to keep it in rap, just to keep it easier, because I I think yeah. if we go every other genre, it's going to be difficult. From this like period of time, like this generation of rappers. Yeah. Well, I think Kanye is going to be remembered because he has such an influence. I think Kanye will definitely. Um, I really like Chance the Rapper. I love Chance, man. He's he's probably my second favorite rapper. Yeah, I think Chance is. Kendrick would probably be up there. Kendrick is definitely like I'd say he's up there with the level of Kanye be honest mm. i mean he's the first freaking rapper who won a pulitzer prize for his work and like what does that mean it's like a prestigious it's like writing a porn award. star award <laughs> uh I, yeah kind of in the way that like you could like you know there's replay value to the well it means something so his pretty much like he got it for poetry and it was for his song um it was off of like I think it was off of uh, his recent album, Damn. Um, I don't know which song it was, but he won like a Pulitzer Prize, which is like given to like it's like a very noble award given to writers, um, just saying like this is a piece of work and it means something and it's very valuable. It's like a very valuable piece of cultural arts, and he won it. So it could be anything. It could be music. It could be poetry. It could be, it could be something like a Stephen novel. King wrote. Yeah, yeah. Wow, okay. So, like, it, but it's not given to just to anybody, you know? Like, there's a reason why he was the first rapper to do it, because, like... That's he, impressive. That's he impressive. puts a lot of really controversial stuff into his raps, you know? Like, especially, like, the atrocities that are happening to their, their, their community of people, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it's just, like... I think that, like, when he is writing a song, he makes sure that every verse means something to a whole wide variety of people. But it also bumps, you know. I've listened, I've heard an author talk about his process of writing and what he does is he writes a sentence and then he he will reanalyze every single part of it on how it could be portrayed, how it could be perceived, how, he, how it could be miscommunicated. And mm-hmm. I'm curious how much rappers put into their each line of their verse yeah well i think a lot of rappers write songs so that they can like bump in like clubs so it doesn't really matter if like the lyrics are great which kanye is like the counterculture to that yeah which is the beauty of or not kanye uh kendrick kendrick's like the the counterculture to that yeah that's the beauty of kendrick because you have your like mumble rap and i think that's like a very like credible source of music i think it's great honestly like a lot of those rappers are extremely talented. Um, and I like fucking they hate it, if we're being honest. I hate it. Well, it's just like, you gotta like, it's just like, it's just good music, I think. I think it's just like, it goes along with the beat. 
And I think that it works with what they create. It flows. Yeah. It like, flows and it's catchy. It gets like, replayed in your head. It's stuck. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then that's like that has replay value of itself, but in the same respect, like a song that you cry to, you're gonna replay it at some point, you know? Mm -hmm. Like the the script song, The Man Who Can't Be Moved, like I've cried to that song and I replay it every time I go through like a hard fucking breakup or something. Like I'm like, oh, I'm the man who can't be moved. <laughs> it's like I'm fucking like tears down. <laughs> like, um, that's me. That's me. I'm gonna, I wanna. Do you think that that song keeps your like almost your definition that you place on that song just keeps shifting over time? Well, the thing is, is that I don't listen to it unless I'm like heartbroken. Okay. So. It, it's like a it's like a acquired taste. So it used to make you think about Sabrina, and now you're thinking about Jessica. Yeah, exactly. But, but still, over the but heartbroken it's like emotion. You you do you just like it's almost like t like bad for you to listen to those songs. It's almost like uh, there's another song, Melancholy Hill. Like I'll listen to that over a breakup, and then I'll think about my past breakups, and I'll be like, oh, now I'm double sad, you know. I'm triple sad because I listened to this through three breakups. You know, it's just going to get exponentially more hard for me to hear those songs. But also, like, I love those songs, so I have to listen to them at some point, you know. But, yeah, songs are fucking crazy, man. They, like, I would love to be an artist who evokes emotion, you know. like I, I, think, I think those songs are the ones that get remembered the most, too. Yeah. I don't yeah. know about you, but I can think back on almost any song, not mm -hmm. any song, but any like older song that I've listened to a fair amount, mm -hmm. and I will have a particular memory. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's like the most trivial fucking memory ever, but it's like, yeah, yeah. I was sitting in the Walmart parking with my buddy, or yeah. parking lot with my buddy, and we were just bumping this. Yeah. And it takes you back to that moment. Yeah, King Kunta is one of those. I got a memory for that yeah. song. Exactly. Like I, I got a bone to pick. <laughs> I don't want your monkey mouth, mouth motherfucker mouth sitting in my throne, throne again. again. <laughs> um, I'm mad, but I ain't stressing. Mad. He ain't stressing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yams. I don't. There's, there's no yams is using that song at some point. What's yams? Yams is the power of that be. beat. Um, but yeah, no. Like I was like in my car, just like driving down freaking uh, Saint or James James River Avenue or fucking street or whatever that highway is um and i was just with like one of my really good friends and we were listening to that song and i can just like remember it like almost like i'm like in that moment you know yeah and i think that's a really powerful thing i think like i think in terms of like the the things humans have done the best that set us apart is the fact that we can do cultural crazy things like that is just like it just makes me think that we're all in the same mindset. You know what I'm saying? We're all connected through music and through our arts. That's like why paintings are so pivotal because like one person can look at that piece of art and like think, Oh my God, it means like my mom, like when she died, like I can like remember like this, like in this painting, I can see it. But then someone can like look at that like same piece of art and be like, I would like I remember like dancing through the prairies and like fucking like being really excited, you know, it's like it's all perspective and it's like beautiful. The and, beauty's like, in the ambiguity. Yes, exactly. And like it just goes to like speak about like how how beautiful those people are and how how amazing they are and like another thing that I want to say like I know we're on Kanye, we're kind of like circle jerking Kanye right now. But, <laughs> um one of the things that he said was like at one point, like, I had such a powerful presence in the world, I did feel like I was almost like a god because I could do anything or say anything and, like, people could take it and, like, l really take it like word, like, like scripture. Like scripture. Exactly. Oh, wow. Um, and that's, like, it's dangerous for someone to have that much power. You know what I'm saying? No one man should have, have all that, that power. power clock ticking and just count the hours you know it just goes back to it you know but that no. is power that's power but it, it's like power through art in a really weird way yeah it's like i think i think this idea is beautiful i'm yeah. gonna manifest it and create it into my own thing and then it's going to have everybody's gonna have their find their own beauty in what i created yeah absolutely that's a weird kind of power i know right 
but it's like it's like opinionated power, uh-huh. well, but to influence the masses in their own yeah way. Yeah, I mean, once you're given that platform, I mean, people like when they look up to a celebrity, they follow their ideals as well. Mm-hmm. And if their ideals change, a lot of the times they'll change their ideals to justify that person. You know what I'm saying? Because like, that celebrity becomes almost like an ideal for them. Yeah. Maybe who they want to be. Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, it just goes back to, like, role models when you were a kid, you know? Like, you still look up to those people no matter what they do. You know what I'm saying? It's like people will kill each other if they don't think that, you know, like, Ronaldo's the best player or Messi's the best player. Like, literally people have killed each other over that debate. So it's like... Wait, people have actually killed each other over that? Yeah, there was a story about a man who, like, literally killed his friend. Messi's better. I'll end the debate right there. Cristiano Ronaldo. Oh, shit. I don't, just like, oh <laughs> I don't have any weapons on me. All right, it's uh, bare hands. Bare knuckle yeah, boxing on yeah, the podcast. Yep. Um, that'd be interesting sounds. Just like, psh, oh, God. Oh, psh, oh. <laughs> Dude, get off me! No, no, uh, no, oh no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill you. Say, say Ronaldo's better. No, I won't. Kill me. Suck my dick. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it takes a lot of work. I mean, you have to be so dedicated to do to to make it to that level. Like every day has to be your art. And a lot of people aren't like I. I know I'm not willing to do that. I have so much shit going on every day like i don't like and honestly at what point does it become excuses not to do it you know Mm -hmm. because like i could like sit down every day over a script analyze it create characters like write every single day and honestly like some days i just like chill out and like don't do shit nothing you know and it's like days like those that are like pivotal. It's like all about time. It's like days like those when I could like be sitting down and like writing a script and like creating characters, like I should be if I actually want it, you know? And it's like I have to like at some point I have to like record myself. Be like, Do you actually want it? Do you want it? Then get it. Get it, boy. Get it. You know? Get it. Like no day. It's almost like that dedication is like the yeah. universe testing you. On that yeah. question, like, yo, how much do you actually want it? Yeah, absolutely. You can't half-ass me, bro. Yeah. Uh, my acting coach right now, he is very passionate about that idea. Like, he's he had, like, relative success, and now he's kind of, like, teaching people. But he's like, every day I'm still working. Every single day I'm trying to produce something. Every day I'm trying to write a script. Every day I'm, like, creating characters because I want it. I want it more than anybody else. And he's like, if I'm not the hardest person working in the room, then I need to raise my game because I should be the hardest person in the room in terms of work. Because the thing about it is that, and this is the way he says it, there's a million people more beautiful than you and more talented than you. Or maybe like you have like the most talent, but if unless you like work harder than everybody else, you'll never be noticed. Unless you're creating content, you'll never get a gig or anything like that. Mm. And so like it's every single day of dedication. It's like telling yourself when you want to like, like we listened to like a tape today actually, and it was like when people like get tired and stop studying and go to sleep, like that's like if you get tired, you should keep studying. Like, if you're a doctor and you, like, really want to, like, solve the mystery of cancer, like, then when you're, like, tired and you're fucking, like, you think that you have an idea, you follow that idea and you don't stop. You know what I'm saying? It's just, like, you know, like, I'm sure, like, fucking Isaac Newton was up every night thinking about, like, his creation of calculus and, like, thinking about, like, what the fuck happened when I dropped that apple? You know what I'm saying? Like I'm sh- like it. It's crazy that like dropping an apple like created like a lot of what we go off of in terms of gravity and things like that. So mm-hmm. Dropping an apple and then dropping a feather. Baby. I always wonder like if minds like Isaac Newton never came around, would we have inevitably figured out some of these things over time? Would another person 
come along or because we're kind of building off of everything in terms of creativity in terms of sports like sports are only improving and Mm -hmm. people look up to other people and they admire them and then they kind of mimic them in terms of science like would we have come up with these mathematical theories Mm -hmm. or explanations to the natural world without particular yeah. minds like Isaac Newton or like how much further would progress be behind if we didn't have some of these incredible minds like the Isaac Newtons, the Einsteins, the Galileos. Yeah. Well, it depends on how metaphysical you are in that respect. Because a lot of, I mean, some theorists believe that like we're all connected and we all share the same, like they think that like ideas are in a pool, right? And, like, ideas... The collective unconscious, almost? Yeah. And, like, some minds are able to grab those ideas and take them down. Like, Isaac Newton was creating calculus as the same time as a German scientist was creating calculus. And, like, Thomas... Yeah. Thomas Edison was creating, like, electricity and, like, well, enhancing electricity and, like, creating the light bulb the same time Nikola Tesla was doing his arc work. So, like, they think that ideas come around at the same time and that like sometimes multiple people will get the same idea is that just because of the point of progress like that's the new problem that's emerging with our like limited resources or or are they like hypothesizing that they're kind of drawing from the ether like taking from the ether of the collective unconscious and that's the the second one they think that there's like they think that there's like a collective conscious and like they're drawing from that and that we all like like we're all like born with that same conscious it's just like how deep do we go into it you know what i'm saying what do you believe do you believe in that personally (sighs) well i need to do a lot more research i'd like to believe it exists because dude like a weird example not that this has like a ton of significance Mm -hmm. but i've i have weird examples like this all the time of for example fuck where was it my buddy okay my buddy from florida who i had not Mm -hmm. talked to in months i was thinking about him and then within 24 hours of me thinking about him specifically yeah hadn't thought about him in weeks months who knows yeah i'm thinking about him he texts me the next day yeah hey man how you doing was was just thinking about you just thought i'd follow up yeah like shit like that happens a lot i know and it makes you well that's why i mean that's why theories are created because there's some evidence behind it. But it's so saying? immeasurable. Yeah, but how do you measure that? Exactly. Like, th- it's so spontaneous and so, like... Uh, it's like deja vu. Yeah, almost like deja vu. It's like, like, did you actually experience that in a dream? Or was that, like, meant to happen? Or, like, you know, it's just like... But you cannot measure that. Unless we create, like, some amazing breakthrough that does. Like, the... Like the uh, Figgs boson or whatever it's called, that particle that like literally like extends dimensions. Um, I've never heard of this. Yeah, th- there's like a particle that like either like extends into other dimensions, or it like travels through time. I don't know which one. It might do both. The I don't know. Wait, what is it? The Figgs. The Figgs boson. I'm gonna watch a documentary on on yeah. this after. Figs boton? Yeah, it's called like the I don't know. It's like the, the dimensional particle or something. And uh, like s- like hundreds of years ago, like uh, a philosopher like said like there is a molecule that can extend dimensions, and it just depends on when we find it. What and does that imply? Does that imply time travel? Does that imply what like what does going to another dimension imply? Uh, imply as far as like the theoretical possibilities of the future. Well. It means that, like, there is such a thing as a dimension just like ours, but slightly different due to choices. Like, each choice... Like another multiverse. Yeah, exactly. Like, when you roll a die, you create six different dimensions off of that die. Because in one dimension, it rolls on one. In another dimension, it rolls on two. It's like that episode of Community, I don't know if you've seen it, where Abed's literally like, you're creating six different universes. And then it, in their universe, it stops like in the middle, like, like pointing upwards, like the seventh possible thing, you know. And it's like each decision 
you can make another decision that goes along with it. Which makes sense that there'd be infinite, because right now I could do yeah. an infinite amount of things. Yeah, like and you could respond in an infinite amount of ways at infinite yeah. points in time. Exactly, exactly. And it, like, once you start thinking about it, like actually thinking about it, like it just makes sense that like there's multiple like dimensions of like how things go, and in like those dimensions like there's a dimension that plays out just like it like just like it is right now but then i say something different next you know what i'm saying or you choose not to listen and or whatever yeah, whatever exactly like infinite like i decide to go and study for my test tomorrow instead to instead come here and just like, do the right, podcast bye. yeah exactly um but that that kind of that implies like agency and free will which is a really empowering thought that you you have the free will and the agency in this world to be able to direct your universe wherever you want it to go through yeah. choices. And I mean that's what that's what makes us a powerful thing because we do decide our own destiny. It's just it depends on the actions we take, you know? It just depends on the paths we're on. And like it kind of like puts a fault to predestination because if there's multiple di- uh, de- uh, multiple dimensions, then there's no such thing as predestination because everything has an implicit cause and effect. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, do you know what predestination is? Uh, I mean, like like determinism, kind of. Yeah, it's like. It's like it goes into religion and like I'm like I I am religious. I am a Christian. Um, But one of the things is, is if God knows all, doesn't he kind of like map out our destinies and like doesn't he kind of couldn't he like kind of like stop things from happening? Um, And that's kind of like what predestination is, is that like God has like mapped out our entire destiny and um, we were predestined to go to where we're going to go. Um. But I and that's been d- debated amongst philosophers for years, for hundreds the, yeah. of years, between Theology. free will yeah. or determinism. Yeah, exactly. And I like to believe that my decisions are my own, but in the same respect, like, there's a reason I think the way I do, you know? And it's because I've gone through what I've gone through. So it's kind of like I think things were meant to happen, have happened, so that I can get to the point where I'm going to go. But at the same time, like, I feel like it's my own decision that's coursing me. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And even the things that are chance, you have, in theory, the agency, the free will to be able to respond however you want to respond to those. Yeah, exactly. Like, At least control as much as, as you can control about the situation. Yeah, like, what's stopping me from packing up my bags right now, going to California and trying to be an actor? Right. You know what I'm saying? Like sure in some dimension i do and in one of those dimensions i make a career and like in like a million and a half dimensions i don't you know what i'm saying so like it's High like risk, high reward yeah exactly and the one thing that i hate about myself is i second guess everything it's so hard for me to come to a decision because i always think of the effects before i think of what can cause them you know mm. what i'm saying like i think Oh, but if I packed up and went, like, one, I have a semester left of school. Like, why wouldn't I just graduate? The other thing is, like, why wouldn't I just, like, go into the Navy? You know what I'm saying? Like, there's so many other things that bind me to the decisions I'm making. You know what I'm saying? Um, And so it's, like, really fleshing out, like, what the possibilities are. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, Like, what path do I choose? And it's, like, I get stuck. I get stuck on one decision because there's so many different options, you know? And think it about it from this point of view, this point of view, this point of view yeah. for, for every single decision. Yeah. And I almost wish that I could just off of a whim do things, but I'm like burdened. It even like goes down to like when I talk to like girls, like in my classes or guys in my classes, I'm like, well, if I said this one thing to them, like how would they react? Mm-hmm. You know, like instead of just being like, I'm going to say this to them and whatever they do is just going to happen. Mm-hmm. I can't think that way. Like the way I think is if I said this thing, how would they react? 
oh, they might react this negative way. I'm just not going to say it. You know? It's just That's like, funny because I'm the exact opposite. And I've come closer to where you are. Mm-hmm. Because I, I was somebody who I would, back in high school, how I, like, perceive my high school self whenever I think back on it is I was a fucking savage. Like, I would say anything that came to my mind, and I wouldn't care about the repercussions. I wouldn't care about, any like, other people's emotions. I wouldn't care about how they react. I just said it if I thought it sounded good, and I was, like, I had, like, no filter. Yeah. And I have since learned to kind of be more empathetic of other people. and. Yeah not say things that may may like end up with me looking bad or whatever it may be well i think that empathy is one of the greatest things about humans because to be able to put yourself in other people's shoes really kind of like divides us from just like animal instinct pack you know like kind of like decisions but it's funny because like you want to work to where I am, but I want to work to where you were. You know what I'm saying? Like we're finding our balance. Yeah, baby. exactly. Um, and it's funny because like I was watching uh, car comedians and cars getting coffee, and one of the things Eddie Murphy talked about with Jerry Seinfeld was when he was in an elevator with Andy Samberg. He was like, "Oh my God, Andy Samberg has so many props, and now I'm nervous because I don't have any props, and I'm just going up to this interview with Jimmy Kimmel." just like propless but then andy samberg was like oh man i have all these props and there's this great comedian (laughs) he's like oh my god like he doesn't have any props at all he must be a fucking master like i gotta have these props it's like they were thinking the same exact thing but it was like vice versa of each other Uh uh-huh you know oh that's hilarious it's funny because like everybody gets nervous even, like, those big superstars, I can guarantee, like, before each show, they're like, what if I mess up a lyric and, like, my fans go fucking bat shit on me, you know? Or they're too drunk to even care. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, you know, liquid courage. That's where, you know, that's when you, But it's, like, like false confidence, too. Yeah. Yeah. Because then, like, if something goes bad, you don't give a shit anyways, and that's not good, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, okay, going off of that... Mm-hmm. This is this is something I've realized about myself and that I've implemented to my personality. So I have to I have to explain what a concept yeah. is before explaining to you what I the belief I hold about yeah. myself. And I think this belief fundamentally at the core of who I am like it just makes me a lot more confident. Like a lot more confident. And it's kind of false confidence. It's uh-huh. kind of like a false dogma I'd tell myself. But anyway, anyway, so the concept that I'm referring to is called metaphorical truth. And what uh-huh. metaphorical truth is, is it's something that is falsified. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's if you prove if you proved it to be right or wrong, it would be false. Mm-hmm. But if you act as if it were true, you are better off. Mm-hmm. So a good example of that is uh, a porcupine pretending it could shoot its quills so you don't get too close to the porcupine and like get stabbed yeah or another example that gun owners use is if if you knew for a fact that the gun was not loaded but you act always like 100 percent of the time you act as if it is loaded uh-huh. so i know 100 percent that this gun's not loaded but i still never pointed at you that's that's kind of the concept of metaphorical truth so like you act as if it's it's falsified like it's pragmatically falsified yeah but if you act as if it were true then you're better off and a belief i hold about myself Mm -hmm. that is a metaphorical truth uh it might sound a little bit arrogant but this is what i this is kind of what i go off of is pete nobody doesn't like me if they don't like me then they're wrong or they're lying because they don't know me yeah and I think that's where a lot of what we're talking about kind of comes from. Yeah. I mean, it's just every way you perceive things, you know. It's like perception is everything. Like, pe- more and more I come to believe that perception is your reality. Like, the way you perceive something is, like, the way that your reality will come. Like, if I said every day I'm going to be the best script writer on the planet at some point, and all I did was write scripts – at some point, I would write a fucking nice ass script, you know, and that reality of mine would be, or that perceived reality would become my reality, 
but it's just like it goes back to like how much work are you willing to put in to make that reality a truth you know Mm -hmm. like it's just it definitely is like the more i grow up and the more i understand the world is like unless you perceive it a certain way it's not going to happen you know what i'm saying like that's a really good way to perceive things like everyone likes me like, I just assume people like me. Yeah, because I, I I act more confidently in those situations if I assume they like me. Yeah. Than if I overthink it because I've been there. I've been there before. If yeah. I overthink it, does this person like me? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I should just be more reserved and not be myself. Yeah. Maybe I should just like kind of kind of back off so that so yeah. that if they don't like me, then at least I'm not offending them anymore. Yeah. But it's like fuck it. Yeah. Like they exactly. they're wrong. Yeah. They're wrong. They don't they don't know me. Yeah. And they're wrong or they're lying to themselves well it's it's crazy because like around you i'm goofy you know i'm a goofy dude i crack jokes yeah i'm crazy but like around like a certain group of people i'm like very shy and it's like the version i have around you is the one i'd prefer to have around everybody fuck yeah dude that's a real shit man yeah like that's awesome. I I love that. I try to make people like that's a goal of mine in any yeah. relationship, friendship, whatever. Like I have with anybody is to try to make them feel more comfortable, more they like themselves more when they're around my like in my presence or exactly. around me, whatever. And I think that everyone should strive to be that way because the more you act like yourself around people, the more they'll act like themselves. And one of the things that I've been having trouble with. And, like, I don't understand it because in, like, high school, which was a while ago for me now, and I don't, like, live in my high school days, actually. I kind of, like, never think about my high school days. But in high school, I was a very free person. I'd go around. I'd act like a goof to everybody, and everybody loved me. But now that I'm in college and I'm, like, kind of more reserved and, like, more, like, conscious of my decisions and things like that, like, it's much more difficult to make friends when you're, like, inside your own head. And, like, that's Mm. one of the troubles I've been having is, like, if you don't act like yourself and, like, you don't, like, give people, like, a vulnerable state, honestly. It's, like, a vulnerable state of yourself, like, actually acting like yourself. Then, like, you'll never, like, truly get to know anybody or nobody will truly get to know you. You know what I'm saying? And it's just, like, honestly a burden. At some point it just becomes a burden because, like, now I just, like – I'll have days where I kind of, like, do show myself, but then, like, I'll become unconfident because I'll be like, oh, I said this one thing, and then I'll think about that one thing all fucking day. Instead of maybe the five things you said that made them laugh, that made them think about things. Exactly, exactly. And it's like I'm trying to work it to where I can, like, be my funny self and my goofy self all the time, but it's really difficult because that, like, that depressed self of mine is like kind of like holding me back. You know what I'm saying? Like the depressed, like it sounds like a self-conscious thing. It like is a self-conscious. It, okay. So if that's the diagnosis, like you're overthinking it, right? Yeah. You're overthinking it. Do you uh-huh. think you're overthinking it pre or post? I think I overthink it pre and post. Oh shit. Because before I go into a conversation, I'm already thinking about what I'm going to say. What if it just hits you suddenly? Like you turn the corner and somebody's there. Usually I'm, like, fine in those conversations. Those are my best conversations. Like, the conversations I just randomly pick up, like, I'm able to smile and be funny. And, like, when people catch me off guard, like, that's, like, the most genuine self of me. You know, like, that's the most genuine point of view you're going to get of Kevin. But when I have time to, like, analyze and, like, think about what I'm going to say, then, like, I'm very careful when I choose my words, you know? Um, but like, you can't be like goofy or funny if the whole time you're thinking, cause like, let's say like something comes up in a conversation and you're like thinking the whole time you're like, Oh, I could say this, but then the conversation is just going to roll along. Like it's not just going to stop so you can think of what next to say, you know, it, it's just going to keep rolling, especially if there's like three people. It's like improv. Exactly. Like improv, like I'm allowed to be goofy, but my best shows are when I'm not thinking. My best shows are when I just go out there and I have fun. On the fly. Whip. On the fly. On the whip. I just fucking quip, whip, and drip, drop, the quip, hit it, spit it, quit it, freak with it. Poop, scotch, what? Poopity, scoop. Scoop, scoop, scoopity, whoop. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, and that's like, 
something that my acting coach, like I'm going to go back and forth between what my acting coach has been teaching me because I think it's important to reiterate the things that you learn. Um, but he was like, there's two forms of meditation. There's active mind meditation where you're actively thinking about something and that's like a form of meditation to like get yourself into character. Like there's this thing called Scott's Technique where you sit, you meditate, and you tell yourself that you are something. So like, I am angry. I am angry. It's like about finding the base emotion in a scene, which like in a scene, you're going to go through a lot of emotions, but you need to find that base emotion. So one of the emotions in my previous scene was like insecurity. Like that was the base emotion. But what I was confused by is like, even though he was insecure, he was happy at points. He was like, kind of like reserved at points but the main emotion was insecurity and so when i like sought down and like fleshed it down to that base emotion i can like go into that state and be like i am insecure i am insecure i am insecure and once you tell your subconscious that enough times scott's technique tells you that you will be insecure and so it's something that you can do to get into characters but then there's something called mindless meditation which is when you blank out your mind completely and they say that's the healthiest form of meditation because once you blank out your mind then you can start to think freely mm. if that makes sense at all yeah because once you get rid of all your preconceptions and all of the things that you think about on a day-to-day -day basis you can actually think freely because you have nothing going into your thoughts. So those are your base thoughts just off of your intuition. And so like, that's what they say. Like, it's like an hour of focus work is better than a whole day of distracted work. It's like focusing your mind, blanking it out, and then allowing yourself to think freely. And that's like what mindless meditation is. So you literally blank out your mind. Like if you're sitting there, thinking i don't i can't think i can't think i don't want to think like that's not mindless meditation mindless meditation is literally silence of the mind and that's like supposed to be very healthy it's like literally like ceos of businesses and like high level figures in acting and ev like almost everywhere you look like the very greatest minds practice some form of meditation yeah, I, I was reading a book by Tim Ferriss, and mm -hmm. pretty much what he does or has done, one of the things he's done is he interviews a ton of successful people, some of the top top class achievers in the entire world. And like you said, actors, CEOs, uh, startup people, like uh, who else, podcasters, whoever, whoever, highly successful people. And I would say – I, I would well over half of them, well over half of them mention in the sh probably six, seven paragraphs that each one of them gets in this book because it's pretty much like a question and then they you read their response on it. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool book to kind of yeah. like skim. Uh, but they I would at least 50 percent, at least if not like 75 to like a, a ton. My point being like majority of these 200 individuals, they all mention meditation. It's something that's difficult to do. I struggle with it. It's so hard to clear your mind. And when you actually try to do it, you'll realize how if you haven't done it before, you you can't do it the first time unless you're like just a natural meditator. Unless you're like it takes really practice. It definitely takes practice. And that's what's like so hard and that like it, it gets back to like everything takes hard work. Everything takes practice. And that's I think a lot of at least for me I think a lot of it was like frustration. Mm -hmm. I'm like, damn, I can't figure this out. Why is this not just easy? Yeah, this should be easy. I'm just clearing my mind. That's all it is. Yeah, it sounds like the simplest task. Yeah, but the simplicity behind that objective, you like, you think the method for getting there is going to be simple too. So then you get frustrated that you can't do it, and then yeah. you give up. At least that's what happened to me. Yeah, no, it's and me I, too. Really? Yeah. And yeah, yeah, you just uh. I don't know, you want to you, you want to get to that goal, but you get frustrated and you end up giving up at some point. Yeah. I just reiterated exactly what I was saying. Yeah, I mean it's all right because 
at the end of the day, who gives a shit? Who gives a shit? Who gives a shit? Yeah, I don't give a single fuck. I don't give a single shit. Nah, shit's given. Nah, shit's. You can give a shit, but you cannot give a fuck. Okay. Well, I'm going to give a fuck. There's nothing you can do about it. Hey, you do you, man. Hey, exactly. I don't give a fuck if you exactly. give a fuck. Exactly. <laughs> oh. Um, but no, it's like things like that. It's like you don't know how good it is until you do it, though, because it's all about like it's like if I never smoked weed once, I wouldn't know what weed feels like and I would never want to do it. Right. Unless I was around people who were doing it and they were like, oh, my God, this is the best shit. Unless like people tell you beforehand that it's really nice, it's really good. Like if you never have a perception of it, why would you ever do it? You know? So and th- it's such a minority of the total general population, yeah, of people that actually meditate that take the time out of their day to just relax and calm the mind. Yeah, but it's like they say it's healthy to do it for like thirty minutes every day, mm. because like it just goes back to like I feel like sleep is a form of meditation, but like your mind is still active. I think during sleep it's probably going through some process that you got to do yeah the dalai lama said that sleep is the best meditation yeah well i get a lot of sleep and i've been having some cool Ah. dreams lately too really like weird dreams like um what's up with dreams i know right right? yeah get on the stage real quick uh so uh what's up with dreams what's up with that (laughs) what's up with that (laughs) What about airline food? I, I just had to pull it out. <laughs> I had to pull it out. What's up with diarrhea? Oh, going strank. Yeah. But seriously, dreams are just fucking bizarre. Oh my gosh, I had this dream. It was a. St- I had a literal full like two and a half hour cinematic dream over like a Spider-Man dream. It was so fucking cool. I couldn't explain it if I tried. I mean, it was literally so a- abstract and obtuse that like it was like spider-man it was like it was like the the miles teller spider-man not miles teller but it was like the new one it was like the animated uh black like young black spider-man he grows up has a family wait spider-man can't be black he wasn't the last one wait was he really different was he actually different universe Dimensions. It was all oh about the shit. multiverse, bro. Oh, okay. It so goes back. It was ch- back. so Childish Gambino got the role. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Simba. Yeah. Um, Have you heard that song by Logic? By the way, it's one of my favorite no. songs of all time. Black no. Spider Man. Really? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's incredible. They made it happen, but it had to be animated. Ugh. But someday it will happen. Uh, different skin Spider Man, just like Obama was president. It's just bound to happen at some point. Oh shit. Um, the future progress yeah but he grows up has a family and has a bunch of little spider-man but then like some evil person corrupts his mind is like you're not spider-man your whole family doesn't have spider powers but then their son is like i'm spider-man and he goes into a different dimension and fights kingpin over this like time machine and then like kingpin falls into this pit and then like he he like looks away for a second and then like kingpin's this really old dude and he's like got a big beard and he almost looks like a gnome it was so fucking weird dude it was so cool though like i love dreams honestly if i'm having a good dream and i wake up i'll go back to sleep to continue the dream because sucks whenever you can't just hop back into the storyline too yeah yeah Damn shame. It's Damn crazy shame. how quick you forget dreams. Oh my like gosh, five, right? Five minutes is being generous, man. Yeah. It's like two minutes, I would yeah. say. That would be my estimate. It's like you need to wake up, get out a journal, and write that shit down. I did that. I did that for a few months. Yeah, because dreams are crazy cool, man. It made me realize you dream pretty much every night. Like yeah. if you get in the habit of you know, waking up and reaching for that journal instead of reaching for your dick – you know, like <laughs> anything's possible. <laughs> exactly. Uh, anything's possible if you don't reach for your dick and you reach for that journal. <laughs> <laughs> reach for that pen and paper, not your penis. 
Pen fifteen though. Do what? Pen fifteen. You haven't heard oh, of Pen fifteen? Oh, I no, I know you're. You talking want to be a part I of the Pen fifteen talk- club? <laughs> no, because they don't like penises, dude. Quit saying I like dicks, okay? I never did. Quit spreading that rumor about it. I never me. did say it. You said it yourself yeah. just a second ago. You said. Well, no, I said I don't like them. Okay. If you say it enough times, it's not true. Dude, I don't like pen. Uh, 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 I didn't say it. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, it. Is it? That's what I thought. I don't like dicks. That's what I thought. Um, but no, I mean, I just, I just, I think that like, dreams are just another thing that make us fucking crazy cool things. I think dogs have dreams too, but they have like dreams to be something. They have uh-huh. to have dreams because. Yeah. I mean, I've w- I used to wake my old, uh, my old puppy up from uh, whenever she was having a bad dream. Yeah. I'd be like, come on, it's fine. Yeah. He's not chasing you. Yeah, but it's nice because, like, like you said, you don't remember dreams. So if you had a bad dream, he woke up and forgot it. But you always remember those bad dreams, like those scary-ass dreams. I very, very rarely get nightmares. Really? I had one, like, nightmare that still stuck with me. It was after the first it. And there was this, like, really creepy-ass clown, and I was going through, like, London town. It felt like London town, like like shanty ass houses like just like kind of like decrepit and i went into a house and it was like hallways but then like there were like masks on the side of the wall and then at one point the like clown like jumped down and scared the shit out of me and i was like oh it's your fuck no i didn't have like a french accent i wasn't like (laughs) i'm going to get out of here (laughs) i need to get my cigarettes (laughs) Hey, oh, I need a stocking. <laughs> um, get away from me, you clown. <laughs> get away from me, you clown. I'll fuck you up. <laughs> I did like the Italian handshake there. So <laughs> I felt like I was going a little bit Italian. With that, eh? um, I love this. Whenever I'm at Italian restaurants, I, I always order everything like this. Yeah. Do you speak I'll take some. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. I'll take the pizza, the pepperoni pizza. They, uh, there was one time when I was serving in the Italian restaurant I work in, Nona's, um, and I did go up to them and I was like, my name is Kevin, but today you can call me Giuliani. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I will be your Italian server tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, yes, the lasagna arrabbiata. It is muah, muy fantastico. <laughs> <laughs> and it felt, it was really a lot of fun. What they, did they say? They, they, they thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, that's awesome. Makes me want to like go up to each table and do a different character. Oh, I love that. I until, love that. Until I'm doing like really crass, terrible characters. Like, oh, you want the lasagna rubbiata? I fuck you up. <laughs> <laughs> I fuck it. No. Nah. Yeah, you do it, not. It, it, Italian mobster. You don't get chicken parmesan. No, you get portobello. I choose for you. <laughs> I am the godfather. Uh-huh. I am the godfather. You listen to me. You know, listen to yourself. <laughs> it's like, I know it's best. If I could work to that point, I think people enjoy that. I think they enjoy the obscurity of like going to a, a restaurant and actually getting an experience. You know, that was my theory, and I pissed some people off. Yeah, I got a lot of complaints whenever I was really? goofy. I'd say nine out of ten tables really, really, really liked me. Uh huh. But I got I got a few complaints, like yeah. uh, like a fair amount. And that was whenever I was being more sarcastic, more goofy, more fun. Yeah, I do. Some people don't like it. The My tables I treasure are the ones I can just, like, shoot the shit with. Like, there was this, there was this guy. He came in kind of like he was a bald dude. And uh, he, at like, one point started, like, giving me a little bit of crap. And as soon as they give you crap, it, like, opens up the gate portal for you to give them yes. crap. Yes. And I started like dissing him, and like he started dissing me, and we it was like I was standing at that table for like, well, what much longer than I was other tables. I was still doing good service though. I never let my service like drop down, but respect, respect. Um, I was having a good time, and as soon as you can like drop that like, uh, cause you do that have that stranger have, like, facade. Yeah, exactly, and you can like actually get real and. And the guy, like, bless his heart, I, I, I pray for his child. I think everybody should. But uh, his grandson was in St. Jude's, um, and he told me that. And I felt, like, very, very Do happy. Do you know the age? Six years old, man. Wow. Yeah. What, what is what – is, I know, obviously, St. Jude, I know it's a hospital. But is yeah. there anything, like, s- specific about St. Jude? Uh, it was cancer. 
He was a young old. boy with cancer. Um, and, man, it was hard because I could tell it was doing a toll on him just to tell me. But I was I was really happy that he was able to open up to me because, like, th- like, it made me feel like I was making him very comfortable. That gave me goosebumps. I literally have goosebumps going yeah. right down my back. That's that's crazy, man. Um, but – it, it's all it's very enlightening that like you can like have just such a s- brief interaction with somebody and they would be able to open up to you and i told them about like all my aspirations and like because once once someone opens up to you you i always open up to them because i don't think it should be one one-sided absolutely you know? they get they they're comfortable enough to open up to you and why not reciprocate yeah um but no it, it was just like it was really tough on him and i like I really felt for him and like honestly in that like brief interaction I felt like I actually got to know him and it was like really nice and like he was a Christian and I just like I told him like I at the end of the day God is good you know I and I think that like maybe like I know some people like have their perceptions of Christianity you know like it's like a lot of the attrition to Christianity comes from this people on the side of the street yelling at people that they're damned because that's literally going against the whole new testament brother jeb yep it's just like it's the epitome of that archetype man yeah it's just it pisses me off as a christian i think that i think all the like non-christian base needs to know as a christian those people piss me off like probably twice as much as they piss you off because yeah to see them killing my religion through hate and just like deceit and like the devil is as much lying to them as anybody at that point because jesus was on this earth to preach love and he said the very the most important commandment was to love thy neighbor as as yourself and the fact that they'd go on the street telling people that they have no possibility of being saved because they're sinners but then them them being sinning or because they're gay yeah and they're they are in the process of sinning themselves by saying that because you cannot judge people you're There's a hypocrite exactly exactly it's just like th- if like we were born to sin the one one of the things that i said to someone who was like against the homosexual community i was like so everyone was born into original sin so that means we're all sinners by being here on earth we're all sinners um, and people like are born mentally, and I think that y- we all can agree mentally to do s- particular sins, like, 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 uh, m- like some children don't have a problem with masturbation. Some do, you know. It's like some some people have to deal with their anger issues, and some people are just born light and don't really have to worry about those anger issues and like won't sin off those. And so like. It goes into it like I think that uh, that like you cannot help who you're attracted to, and it's l- one of the things that we like last talked about in in the last time I was here. It's like you cannot help who you're attracted to. It's just something that is a base level of who you are as a person, and and that frustrates people sometimes. They're like, ah, I want you, but I don't want to want you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like you sound I mean, like a fucking psychopath. Yeah, but I mean, like, <laughs> not really. I. I mean, I'm gonna be honest. I like, I like some girls who like. I think of like some girls like, and I'm like, damn, they'd fuck up my life if I was yeah, ever with right. them. But I'd be like, damn, I'd be with them if I had a chance. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Like, it's just like I don't necessarily want to be attracted to that person, but like, if I got the chance, like, yeah, I'd have them in my life. You know? It's just like no one, no one controls that. And one of, like, the stories, and I'm going to, like, write a script about this at some point, is, like, one of the stories my friend told me about him coming out, and he he was l- he came out to his youth pastor. Mm. And a youth pastor is someone that you can devote a lot of your trust to, right? In theory. And in theory, in theory. Like, a youth pastor is someone you should be able to come to and tell your grievances and he'll help you work through them and not try and change you because to try and change a person is redundant and counterintuitive in itself you know um but he went to his youth pastor and he got backlash and like 
do you you can't imagine how harmful that is to a young man especially in his walk of faith you know he came out so like came out as in he was the first person he told he was gay to yeah i'm pretty the sure the very first person yeah and he the feedback he received was fucking judgment yes. for who he is yes that's what i'm saying it's like jesus preached love if there was a homosexual on the side of the street jesus would not shun them He'd say, become one of us, brothers. Respect, respect. That's exactly what he would say. I mean, he wouldn't. Go, I mean, he went up to prostitutes and was like, become one of us. You are our sister. Like, you are just as good as anybody else. <clears throat> and it's just like, people who go against that are sinning in their own rights. That's one of the obsolete parts of Christianity, in my opinion, is the whole homophobic approach to... Or maybe ju- like just judgment in general. I think there's a. Do you think? It, what do you think? Do you think Christianity? Not everybody, mm-hmm. but maybe generally speaking, do you think it's a a an ideology, a religion, uh, whatever you want to say, a philosophy about God, about this world that is kind of um, clouded with a lot of judgment. Well, if you're asking if, like, Christianity is a religion that is meant to base judgment upon people, is that what not, you're asking? Um, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying a very common misinterpretation of Christianity is being a judgmental fuck. I think that if you're looking at, like, uh, the, like, Southern Baptist point of view, I think a lot of their things are, like, we shouldn't allow people into our religion if they don't follow a code. So I think that, like, it's all interpretation. It's too much dogma. Yeah. Too much dogma. Because the thing is, is that I go to a liberal, like, well, I'd say moderate church. um, And one of the things the pastor said was, like, a lot of interpretations of the Bible are because uh, humans have taken the Bible in different forms and interpreted it different ways for thousands of years. And so... One of the things he said was... Game of Telephone. Yeah, exactly. It's like... Well, it's it's like a game of telephone, but at some point, someone actually tries to interpret it a way that they want to so that the next person will say what they they want them to say. Okay. Um, And so one of the things he said was in the original Hebrew translation of the Bible, there was nothing against sex... Or, uh, There was nothing against homosexuality. It was actually common in that time for there to be pedastric uh, relationships, which was when uh, a young man would have a mentor, and that person, that mentor, would provide them with, uh, like, lessons and a home. um, And in, in in like, return, that young person would have sexual relations with them. And so... Like what was the exchange again? Sexual relations for what? For like that person, like teaching them a trade, giving them a home, feeding them, things like that. So like arguably a form of prostitution. Arguably a form of prostitution. And I'm That's kind of what a sugar daddy is in modern times. Yeah, though. and he said that was the that was what the Bible originally said was wrong. You cannot use sex as a form of like transactions you know what i'm saying um and at some point they interpreted that as well a man and a man shouldn't be in a relationship so that the misinterpretation was a man and a man yeah so what the bible i think originally said and like i shouldn't be quoted on this because i'm definitely not a theologian um but th- what I interpreted what he was saying was that pedastric relationship between a man, like an older man and a younger man, in terms of like almost like prostitution where like the, the older man will provide all of these services and all of this like homestead and food and things like that. And the younger man, all he has to do is uh, provide sexual relations to that man. I believe that the Bible taught originally that that was wrong not homosexually as not homosexuality as a whole okay absolutely and that's what i interpreted from that lesson but 
once again, don't quote me on it. Everybody interprets the Bible differently. And honestly, I am not one to say that any interpretation is wrong. I can just have my own biased point of view. But I think you and I can both agree that there's no need to hate gay people. Oh, I mean. Like, why the fuck? Who cares? It's your sexual orientation. People are who they are, man. Exactly. I will never, ever shun a a gay man until he does something wrong to me. Yeah, ethically, morally wrong. Or, like, possibly even legally. But, yeah, yeah. But, honestly, like, and I will say this, like, I think a lot of reasons why they are, like, so, uh, like, like protested against is because they 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 are so free the way that they like exert themselves is in such a free way because like and i wrote this as a joke but i mean it like once you accept that there's going to be a population of people even maybe even your own fucking parents will disown you once you accept the fact that you are who you are you're you're a gay man you love or you're a man who is gay i guess like person first language but you're a you're a man who is gay and you love other men and you know that for a fact and you accept that and you accept the fact that there's going to be populations of people who hate you just because of that like i think you can start to think more freely for yourself because you develop that fuck it mentality yeah you're like they don't like me who the fuck cares i get to be me i get to express myself for who i want to be yeah Dude, I'm trying to get that gay confidence, man. <laughs> I'm trying to get on that gay confidence. Yeah, yeah. I just, <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I like, I've never, like, a lot of the men and women who I've seen who are homosexual, like, exert themselves and have an exuberancy about them that I would love to have myself. They are freely expressing themselves. They are. They, they seem to be very. Um, very expressive in who they are yeah yeah i think you worded that very well yeah and i think that's beautiful and i honestly think that a lot of straight men in a masculine point of view have to be reserved and like masculinity for such a long time was coating your emotions with fucking ice cream and sugar cakes well not not well it was more like coating your emotions with hard concrete and musky old man smell but never actually, like, expressing yourself. Like, to express yourself for a long time was not something a man would do. So it's almost like they get their form of masculinity is, I don't know, you could say this is wrong or right, but it's it's freeing. It's freeing in a way that they get to express their emotions a lot more because their interpretation of masculinity is that they can be masculine, but also, I guess, kind of present themselves and... and, not present themselves, express themselves freely. Yeah. And their emotions. But they, they they usually end up more feminine. Why do you think that is? Well it's because I think if you're thinking of it at a biological point of view, they are they have more effeminate properties to their mind. Mm. Um and I think that like it's I don't think that just I don't think it's like a choice decision. I think that they just are more feminine and the the way that they think and the way that they are. Well, how do you explain the bears? You know, like the the really masculine gay dudes. Like a, a bear is basically like a big fat gay dude. Or uh-huh. uh, no, no, no. Like hu- husky is probably a better word. Husky and hairy. But my my like my understanding of that is that they're more so like the more masculine kind of dudes. Yeah, and I mean, it's just it just it's just a person who has a lot of masculine values but still prefers men over women i I mean i don't think there's any way you can literally like describe it it's just like brains have so many properties to them Mm. you know and we think the way that we think no matter what like it it does depend a lot of it is behavioral but they've done a study you know they've separated twins and they more or less they end up kind of similar to each other um and part of it is their behavioral personality and part of it is the environment that they're around you know um but they will have properties that are like similar to each other Mm. um and so i think it's just like when we come to understand the mind more 
we will come to understand all these different way of thinkings, you know, like you can't really classify anything right now because there's so little knowledge on why people think the way that they do. I mean, if you think about it, behavioral psychology has only been around for like what, 60 years. And before that point, who would have started that Freud? Uh, he was like, a he, he was one of the people who made it popular. What he did was father of psychology. Yeah, what he did was say there are reasons people act a certain way, and what he did was focus on like mother motherly nurturing and relationships like that, and people who do not receive nurturing when they're younger will act much differently to someone who does receive nurturing when they're younger. Wow. Um, and so like it's just like what he said is that the environment does have an effect on the way that people think. And then there's been continuous studies and like, there's this great show it's called mind hunters. And it kind of like is roughly based around the fact that like serial killers, they had like really fucked up or like really crazy things happen to them when they were younger to where they think and act the way that they do. And like, not anyone can just be a serial killer. It, it does go down to like, what they went through as a child or something like that because like one of the people um like he would like dress up in women's clothes and like shoes and things and his mom would just like at some point she like made him like act that way because she wanted a daughter or something like that and oh wow when he grew up he loved women's clothes and he would kill women and like photo shoot them and things like that but it it's like once you like talked like talking to them as like if they were people was a very wrong thing to do during that time because they were so shunned by the communities and so when we started talking to those people and actually understanding the psychology behind their actions we were able to deeply understand why they acted the way that they did and a lot of the reasons was because of their upbringings and like what they were taught as children. And then another, r another thing is that they like had the mental capacity to uh, cross the threshold and actually do those actions. And so it's just, as we understand psychology more, do they give a, do they give like a, I guess a hypothesis on why, like what serial killers gain from killing people? Oh, I mean, it's euphoria. It's like deep, deep forms of euphoria. It's like them, they fantasize it. And it's like continuously something that pops in their mind. And it it's starts. Like sex. It's like sex, but much, much greater. What they're, wow. It's like, imagine your wildest dreams coming true. And that's what it is to them. And it just like. One of the people was a co -ed, the co-ed killer. I think is like his name's some Ed something. Um, uh, but he like would pick up women, and it started off like every once in a while he would like he was a really big guy, so like it started off and like he would like you know do like crass things, but he didn't like kill anybody, and then he actually did kill someone. And, like, in the show, I don't know, this is probably part of the interviews and things like that, but in the show, they asked him, like, well, did you ever go back to that spot? And he was like, yes, I went back to that spot numerous times to relive it. And they were like, did you ever masturbate? And he was like, yes, I would masturbate to relive it. And the dude would literally, like, chop people's heads off and then literally have sex and perform fellatio with their, like, head, their heads chopped off. And so, like, crazy-ass dude, don't get me wrong, he was probably born with a little bit of craziness in him, but through his upbringing, he, like, those things got cemented, you know? And that's why, like, people try and, like, figure it out when they're young, you know what I'm saying? That's why, like, uh, that's why there's so many, like, psychological studies now, because the more that we understand it, the less it will happen the more that we can catch it. And so that's one of the things that the show preaches, and that's one of the things that was brought up in Joker. It's like, yeah, the Joker's a crazy, crazy-ass villain, but there were things that kind of led up to it. And he was, yeah, he had schizophrenia, which is probably something that he inherently had, 
but the world also kind of shit on him a little bit. And, like, the thing I don't get is that, like, a lot of people are, like, debating whether it, it should be a film because there's so many, like, crucial things that happen in it. But in my point of view, like, you never respect the way he thinks. And you never, like, you never, like, simp like you, you can kind of, like, empathize for him, but you never, like, are, like, well, I'm, like, happy he did that, you know? Um, like, you never respect it. But you can see it. You, you can gain a better understanding. It. Yeah. Um, but it's just like it just goes back to the question: Are people driven to what they do, or a, is it like a biological thing? I think in some cases it's biological, but I think a lot of it is due to the environment that they grew up in. Mm. Um, but that's just one of the things the show questions, you know. And it's just like uh, disruptors, you know, like disrupting the way that you think because every person has a mind every person has some sort of moral code that they follow um and it's just trying to kind of like deviate away from those like delinquencies that like as soon as we understand it more we'll be able to catch it and stop it so but i mean it's like, I'm talking from a point of view from, like, I've seen some films and things like that. So, there's probably some things that I'm saying incorrectly. But this is, like, I can see all of this, you know? Like, I can see it as true. You know what I'm saying? And do you have a craving to understand it? Uh, not necessarily a craving, but it intrigues me. It, it definitely interests me. Like, um, There's a lot of intrigue and just fasc – not fascination. I don't, know, mm -hmm. I don't know if I like that word. But – I don't know. I just just curiosity about serial killers and the general public. Well, a lot of podcasts are based off of serial killers. Yeah, I mean, they're very interesting people. I mean, not everybody can do those sort of things, and it's not good that they do. But I think that we should come to an understanding on why they do what they do, and I think that like it's important as like a human species to understand us more and more even to prevent it to prevent it but also to just understand why it happens and maybe so to understand the species a little bit better as well yeah yeah because what fundamental needs we need when it comes to nurturing yeah absolutely i mean a lot of those people are extremely smart people and that's why they get away with it for so long like the dude the co-ed killer literally in the show was like yeah, I had to turn myself in because I felt guilty over what I was doing, but I couldn't stop myself anymore. Oh. Like, they, I knew that they weren't going to find me. So I, like, had to, like... Because he was friends with, like, the police officers in that city, so none of them, like, would have expected him. But then he, like... I guess he, like, turned himself in. I don't know. But, like, they even found, like, indescribable clues that... That it was him, but they like were dissuaded against it, and so, like, yeah, I think that, uh, and it's weird. Like, you can never understand. Like, if they do have like empathy, like they must fucking hate themselves, you know? Like, they must absolutely fucking hate themselves for what they do, but they crave it and they can't stop it. It's like they know it's wrong. Yeah, it's like. When you're a smoker, and at least nowadays, when you're a smoker, you know that smoking's bad for you, but you do it anyways, mm -hmm. you know? Like, no, like, addictions can be healthy, but, like, you know the bad addictions when they're there, but it doesn't stop you from doing them, you know? And so, I think understanding that the theory of, like, addictions and cravings and things like that, so we can stop those addictions and cravings, because, honestly, I think... Addiction is a very real, very real thing. And addiction didn't have a name for a long time. Like, I mean, it's just like we're understanding ourselves more. Mm -hmm. And I think that it just is a, us coming to a whole of self-actualizing exactly what we are as people, as minds. Because at the end of the day, we're all a collection of minds, like, I, like we were talking about earlier. So it's not crazy or fanciful to think that maybe we're all collecting from the same place you know what i'm saying 
And if we can figure out where that place is and what's going on in that place, then maybe we can understand more about like the way that each of us think, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. To understand those extremes may help us understand, I guess, the the species as a whole a little bit more. Yeah. And I think that's uh, that's something that we need to come to. I mean, I think that we're naturally and organically coming to a point where we accept everybody for who they are. Mm. Except for, of course, like the crazy people. But, like, I mean, in the last, like, 60 years, I mean – we've i mean 70 years now um we've had crazy advances in like culturally accepting people uh diversifying the workplace things like that like that's a whole new idea and i think we take it for granted like the fact that like we can like accept like the new generations are definitely more pro this than the old generations but now that we can accept like immigrants see their value um, see why they belong in our societies, why we need more of them in our societies and like being perversity. I think we're just naturally and organically getting to a spot where we can like work as an entire species. And I think that's what we need to do. I mean, the thing about it, we're all the same thing. And the more we work together, the more advancements we're going to make. And I think that that's uh, the way that everybody needs to think is like we are all the same thing. And so why do we hate each other? And it all goes back to seeing past the differences. Exactly. I mean, for a long time, the differences were just black and white, brown and white, you know, like and whites had the power at that point. They had the guns. They had the things that they had more like weaponry. They were just like more powerful. And we're getting to a point where naturally and organically we're all on the same plane. And it will happen maybe not in the next hundred years, but at some point we're all going to be on the same page. And we're all just going to want to better ourselves. And I think that's what we need to work towards. Like, I can guarantee that if, like, since the medical advances are happening, I can guarantee that if we all worked and we didn't give a shit about money and we all worked on, like, trying to like make these medical advancements happen like make these advancements in technology happen like if we all like worked synergistically together i think that we would have twice as many advancements as we've had so far probably even more than that exactly because like do you think this is very utopian though well i think that like we should work towards a utopia shouldn't we like a perfect world or is that like too crazy to think about I mean, sometimes a crazy dream is a great dream to dream. Yeah. But uh, simultaneously, is it realistic? Well, who knows? Unless we try, you know? It just goes back to what we were talking about earlier. We can't, like, at some point, we have to stop second-guessing ourselves about this. And we just have to move forward and make the decisions, you know? But getting everybody on the same page, is that realistic? Well, that... That goes down to ideologies. That's not very realistic. I think everyone's going to think differently. But we can. I think we can all think on a general page that, like, the advancement of ourselves as a total population of humans is the best thing that we can think about. Like, everything else is just, like, greedious. And just, like, if you want your own race to prevail, then that's kind of, like, against what we should be moving towards i think i think that's also organically what we're moving against right now in general i can just see us making these improvements on the way that we think and more and more in the newer in the newer generations like people are more actively starting to think about well like what is really different about me and him what is different about me and her like there's nothing different we're both intelligent, able-bodied people, and we can start making progress on becoming like a full, united group of people. You know, and it's I wild to me how, to think how many generations that's taken too. Yeah, because you would think it just takes one or two, and you're like, oh, they're just different. That's it. Yeah, but we're still dealing with the ripple effects of the of slavery in the 1800s. Well, the thing and is, whatever happened before that as well. Yeah. I agree. But the thing is, is that 
people are a lot of what they're taught when they're younger. And when you're taught that you should hate a certain person, like, and a lot of it's just going to be from what you pick up from the actions of your parents or people who you grew up around. And you're going to kind of like endorse those kind of ways of thinking. Um, but cultural literacy is so important in that way because the more you're in, in uh, invested in different cultures, the more you're going to think that all cultures are the same. And that's why cultural literacy is such an important thing. And that's why, like, I think it should be necessary for someone to travel the world at some point in their life and to see all these different cultures. Because one of the things that the pastor at my church did was he was Southern Baptist at one point. And he was completely against homo, uh, homo, like he was totally homophobic. He was against homosexuality and religion until he started to sit down with people who were homosexuals mm. and started hearing out their stories. And when he That's humanizing. Yes. And when he started to hear the atrocities that were put against them just because of the way they were attracted to people, like parents disowning their own fucking children, man. Like whole groups of communities shunning those people. If you hear that as a Christian, if you still think that way, you're not a Christian anymore. You're following your, you're practically just part of a cult. Because you're following your own ideology at that, yeah. at that point. Because, you know, there was a reason that Jesus was on the earth. And there's a reason why that specific person is in multiple different religions. Like Jesus is someone that was in multiple different religions and that's why he's such a crazy anomaly that happened to the world was because we can guarantee that he did happen because he is in all of these different religions in different ways so he's in mm -hmm. judaism he's in um he's in christianity he's in christianity <laughs> um and he's also in uh, the the muslim uh islam islam is he, he really yeah I knew Abraham was in all three. I didn't realize Jesus was as well. Yeah. And so, like, we know that he was a thing. We know that he was on this earth, and we all know what he preached. He preached love. He preached acceptance. And if you're a Christian, you got to believe that's God on earth. And if you're a Christian, you got to believe in God. And if you don't believe in what he preached, I just don't, I don't, I don't see how you could be a Christian anymore. You know, it's just like if you don't love everybody like yourself, even the f like messed up people like that's just part of being human is like you're going to have your judgments. Mm -hmm. But part of being human is working past those judgments as well to become more Christ like. And so and a lot of the judgments and going back to like racial and not mm -hmm. and homophobia and everything, a lot yeah. of it comes down to ignorance, it seems. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Because once once your pastor met a gay individual, then he was like, "Oh, this guy's human. Just another human walking the earth, just like me." Yep. He's got his own story. He has his own hardships. Yep. Why should his sexual orientation?